Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. You are listening to the Connect virtual webinar series hosted by Carrie Free. And this one is a special webinar. We have two guest presenters that we're thrilled to introduce. Uh, Dr. Karen Tyndall, um, on the right of your screen, is originally from the UK where she worked as a family dentist before moving into orthodontics in Arkansas. She is also a certified professional life coach and the founder of Balance Doctor, where she supports and empowers dentists and physicians to live the life they want now. Her expertise gives her clients the opportunity to discover who they really are and to create a work-life balance equilibrium that will maximize their ability to be successful. Uh, Dr. Julie Kellogg on the left is a third generation dentist who practices with her father and uncle in Walla Walla, Washington. Dr. Kellogg is past president of the Walla Walla Valley Dental Society, past course director for introduction to dentistry at Walla Walla University, and past governing board member of Walla Walla General Hospital. Uh, in 2015, she completed the Washington State Dental Association Leadership Institute and is currently a columnist and editorial bo advisory board member for the WSDA News. She's also continuing her training as a whole person coach and is the 2020 program director for the AADP annual meeting. In addition, we have Dr. Kutz joining us. He's the founder of Carry Free and an internationally recognized speaker. He's published hundreds of papers in dental and medical journals, and we're lucky to have him as our resident caries risk management expert. So Dr. Cooch, would you like to say a few words and officially hand it off to Dr. Tyndall and Dr. Kellogg? Well, thank you, Kendall. And I have to tell you, I am really excited about this presentation. When I first talked to Julie and Karen about it, um, you know, just looking at coaching in our ever-changing world environment today, um, and how to go about that. And coaching is something that's very near and dear to my own heart and has uh, changed my life. So you, you ladies are rock stars and I cannot wait to hear your presentation. So take it away. Thank you so much. We are so honored and excited to be on the Carry Free Connects series. I'm a huge fan of what Carry Free brings to dentistry and to our patients. And I want to give a huge kudos to the entire team at Carry Free for all of their work behind the scenes to pull off this webinar series. Carry Free utilizes the concepts of wellness coaching, and we're excited to share how you can put a few of these pearls to use even today. We are going to begin by sharing a little bit of Karen's journey in dentistry. Thanks, Julie. On the 31st of December, 2015, I walked out of my orthodontic practice in Harrogate in England, and I didn't know if I would ever practice dentistry again. Coming from a family of doctors, I knew that I wanted to be in a caring profession, but I also know, knew that I didn't want to be a doctor. Dentistry was an obvious choice for me, and it was definitely the right choice. At that point in 2015, I'd never known anything else but dentistry. In England, dental students start dental school at age 18, and I qualified just a couple of days short of my 23rd birthday. I had the perfect job, and I loved orthodontics. And I was also proud to show my two daughters that I could combine being their mum and also go to work. My husband, who's also English, worked for Walmart in the UK and he was offered a role at the Walmart World Headquarters here in Bentonville in Arkansas. As a family, this was the opportunity of a lifetime for us and something that we couldn't turn down. I woke up on New Year's Day 2016 and my professional identity was gone. Karen's journey is really remarkable in terms of seeing so many dentists who are transitioning at different points in their life feeling this loss of identity. As a third generation dentist, following in the footsteps of my grandfather, my father, and my uncle, I've had quite a bit of my own journey of finding my own unique professional and female identity. Through this professional experience, I have developed a keen interest in multiple generations in the workplace. Fast forward now to 2020, Dr. Karen and I connected earlier this year through our online coaching community, 
and discovered we have very similar journeys, both as being dentists and as coaches. While I do more dentistry and apply coaching every day in my practice, Karen is now doing more one-on-one -on -one coaching and no longer practices dentistry here in the U.S. However, we are both trained and apply the philosophy of whole person coaching. Let's give you a bit of an introduction to what that really means. As Julie just said, we have both been trained as whole person coaches. To explain what whole person coaching is all about, we'd like to share with you the definition as created by our mentor, Ferocia Knight. She explains, when an individual comes to know, embrace and express all aspects of their wholeness, they are positioned to thrive in any aspect of their life. They become rich in resources, grounded in their being and at peace within. A whole person coach draws upon and integrates every aspect of an individual. It's their mind, body, heart and spirit. And an individual coach also helps these individuals explore the many facets of their life. It's really about self-awareness and self-acceptance. That turns into actions and accountability. This is true for both of us as coaches, as well as those of you looking to navigate change and develop your preferred future. And it does not exclude any individual's personal, religious, or spiritual beliefs. In fact, it fully envelops them. The slide you are looking at shows the web of life, which is a unique coaching tool. It takes into account all the facets that make up an individual, which make up a whole person. It not only looks at mind, body, and spirit, but also professional lives, relationships, our environment, and our health. When you see a complex web, it is attached by many points. And if part of it becomes detached, then it's no longer a functional web. This is shown by the integrated nature of the diagram and shows that our lives function as a whole. The web of life would have been an extremely useful tool for me back in 2016 when we were about to move to America and I was facing many uncertainties. Anyone can use the concept of this web of life for themselves to look in depth at their whole person and to see how integrated life really is. Or of course, a whole person coach such as ourselves can help you with this tool also. We have four and sometimes even five different generations in our families and our workplaces now. Each of us as a generation and as an individual has been shaped by very different and unique experiences. This web is a really helpful metaphor to keep in mind as we explore and honor each generation and how they are reacting to the current crisis. And I think you will find this helpful as you lead and interact with your teams during this time. It certainly begs the question, will this crisis bring greater solidarity between the generations or greater divide? Let's explore a few trends. The baby boomers were born out of World War II. They come across as a bit invincible and probably a bit less receptive. They hold most of the wealth and they're tending to outlive those retirement accounts, which took a big dip in the last month. They have a really tough exterior, but underneath they are starting to be concerned, maybe even a little scared, especially in regards to their health. But they're jumping right in and they're trying technology, they're embracing it, and they're really using it to stay in touch with their families. I know I've definitely seen grandparents on the other side of the Atlantic, they're becoming experts at Zoom and um, really keen on watching things on YouTube. So they're pretty excited about what they can do now. And my dad's getting pretty good at getting on these webinars and making comments. <laughs> <laughs> Karen and I are both of the generation Gen X, which is between the two bigger generations. We were largely born in the Cold War era and were known as the latchkey kids. We grew up with dual working parents or divorced parents, and largely we came home from school and took care of ourselves. We are self-sufficient, adaptable, calm, 
and we know how to be alone. I really feel that we're poised to be the leaders and the very much needed voice of calm during this crisis. We are concerned, but we are confident that we can adapt. The millennials are the other large generation and they live in an online world. They also hold the highest amount of student debt. They have very little patience and they want instant gratification. They expect a high level of service, which in turn leads to a low brand loyalty. They change their jobs really often looking for various forms of fulfillment. They are known as the generation of worry. Thus, they are tending to change their behavior the most during this crisis. And I think we will likely see them shifting towards looking to more stability in their lifestyle. Generation Z. These are the kids that I am the most excited about, the oldest of which are just entering their 20s. They have been having a great time and they have never seen any life-altering events, such as the things that many of us reflect back to, such as 9-11. They're very individualistic. They're showing themselves to be quite thrifty because they're observing the debt of their parents and their older siblings. This crisis is going to be a definite turning point in this generation, and it's going to be fascinating to see how they come through this and how it affects their decisions. I think the first thing that we're going to see is how do they start changing their decisions regarding going to college and where they are going to go to college. I'm witnessing Gen Z experiencing this firsthand and I think that they are surprised that it's been more of a challenge than they expected it to be but also now it's seeing them like digging into their resources and really sort of taking control of what they're doing and yeah I think they're doing really well. to all of us to see how we react as well. To put all this really simply, some of us tend to think better on paper, and some are thinking more through the screen. There's no doubt that for right now, we are all coming together through technology. We are transitioning. Karen and I have been joking a lot as we have worked on this webinar because both of us came through when we still did a lot of paper and the internet was just coming into its own. And so we have to put all of our thoughts and ideas on paper before we can convert them to outlines and PowerPoint slides on a computer. And we've come to the conclusion that we're quite inefficient. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that we've easily doubled our workload with this. Moving across the world is definitely the best thing that we have done as a family but it's probably also the most stressful. We moved to a place where we didn't even know one single person and we were over 5,000 miles away from any family or friends. For the first time in my adult life though, I didn't have to go to work and that was something that I'd always dreamt about what would it be like. The first few months were filled with learning how to live in a foreign country and there was so much to do to set up a new life for us all. My husband went to work, the children went to school, so I was able to be on top of all the whole household tasks and focus on my girls 100%. And it was great to be able to do these things for the first time because it was probably something that I'd had mum guilt about in the past that I couldn't devote all my attention to these things. However, Ever since I put down my dental instruments, I had been going through somewhat of a grieving process for my loss of professional identity. It was a feeling of loss from not being a professional anymore or not being an expert at anything in particular. I had a nagging question in my head and I would ask myself, who is Karen? And I remember thinking if only I could type this question into Google, that I would have been able to find the answer. We want to share a few of the tools from our training 
and how they can help us respond to sudden changes and new situations that we are experiencing. I have long believed that crisis breeds innovation and change, but we often have a very strong emotional reaction to change, and many of us require a transition period. This is akin to a type of grief or grieving process, as Karen referred to in her experience. How we go through this process can be very important. In our current situation, there are so many emotions that we are experiencing. And anything that a person is experiencing right now is a normal reaction to a very abnormal situation. We're dealing with a lot and it can feel like we're on a bit of an emotional roller coaster some of the time. We often judge ourselves for having these feelings and we push them to the back of our minds. And we aren't really very good at giving ourselves a chance to acknowledge them and consider what's really going on. An important part of this process of transitioning to change is learning to label our emotions. I'm not saying that we should tell ourselves everything is going to be okay and it is okay right now, but just to have an awareness that what we're feeling right now is normal. During a particularly difficult time in my life, about five years ago, I was experiencing a grieving process, and a dear friend and mentor of mine gave me some very good advice. She told me that when these powerful and unexpected emotions come up, that I need to try to find one or two minutes just to really feel it and be with it, and then go on to release it. I put this into action many times during a busy day in the dental practice, sneaking into the bathroom, leaning against the counter, taking a deep breath, just letting the emotion watch over, wash over me. Usually, within a minute or two, I would be able to release it and move on about my day. But other times I would realize that there was something more to this that I needed to spend some time processing or digesting. So I would put it on the shelf until later, an evening or a weekend when I would have a little bit more time to sit with the emotion. This became a really powerful tool, both for survival and for healing during that time. Just this morning, I was reading a really interesting diary of an ER doctor from New York City. The very last sentence of this diary was so poignant and I think speaks really strongly of what we're talking about, of labeling and feeling your emotions. The conclusion statement was as follows. For doctors to survive during this pandemic, we have to feel each moment, even if it makes each moment more difficult to endure. And as we know from reading the news headlines, so many of these doctors had in both in New York and in some of the cities hit hardest or in Italy have had to make some really difficult decisions. And I think this is just a really powerful example of being able to just take those brief moments to sit with those emotions so that you can continue to carry on. I love this picture on the slide of all the emojis on the eggs. It seems like the news is changing every hour. And I feel sometimes that I'm having to use a different emoji in my text messages every hour just to keep up with things. But I think it's a really great visual tool that we can use that's so pertinent to our right now technological culture of labeling our emotions. The thought of who is Karen kept on going in my mind. I had a really great new life. I had the time to learn to play tennis, I met up with friends for coffee, I baked cakes, and I got a dog to take for walks. But I still felt a little bit guilty. Despite this great lifestyle that I had, something was still missing. I felt that I was really busy, and in between school drop-offs and collections, I had plenty to occupy my time. Yet I remember really disliking emptying the dishwasher or folding the laundry. Tasks that when I was working, didn't get a second thought, were now just becoming so much more significant to me. I had to make up a game for myself to empty the dishwasher, where I would set a five minute timer on my phone to motivate me to get it emptied within that five minutes, otherwise I would find that the dishwasher would drag on. 
I did have the insight though to realize that it wasn't really the dishwasher that was bothering me. So I took a cup of tea outside into the sunshine and I sat down to think. And I asked myself, what is really behind all of this? And after a short while, the answer popped up into my head. I was bored. When we experience a strong or powerful emotion, or when we answer the simple question of, how are you? Our brain tends to feed us the common buzzwords of the day. I hear this all day with my patients in the practice. I'm so stressed. Oh, I'm tired. Oh man, I'm busy. Or I'm good with the proverbial shrug of the shoulders. We would like to challenge you to look beyond these buzzwords. What are you really feeling and why? Can you find a more specific or descriptive word? The first word that we've chosen here is uh, one of our buzzwords is the word busy. And this is a word which you will probably no doubt hear multiple times of the day. It's essentially a badge of honor that people use now to look like they've got lots going on and they're achieving. Um, and it's definitely, I notice it a lot more here in America that people use this word and they're proud to say that they're really busy. But we thought we'd look beyond that and see what you could use instead of saying busy if you wanted to answer this question. Perhaps if your day was very full, maybe you've accepted too many invites, that your to-do list is super long, that you're feeling overloaded, there's just so much going on. A positive spin on this would maybe by saying I'm productive, that you do have a long list of things to do and you're checking them all off and working through that list and that's a really positive way of explaining that you're busy. Well, the third option here is preoccupied. Not so positive, but we are allowed to feel not so positive emotions. That there's just so much going on that you are a little bit distracted, that it is feeling a little bit overwhelming. And just all these terms just take one step on from that automatic response that comes out quite often is just, I'm busy. So that's why choosing another word will just help other people understand a bit more about how you're actually feeling. And I think busy really is a huge badge of honor. I'm guilty of using it all the time. So I like to use a little bit more of a colloquial term saying that I'm kicking butt. Karen, however, has informed me that this is not proper English. Not English. <laughs> Another badge of honor buzzword that we use a lot is stressed. It almost seems like that if you can't say that you're stressed, you're not accomplishing enough or you haven't set your goals high enough. But let's look beyond that a little bit. Let's look at what you're feeling maybe in your body or in your muscles. We see this a lot with our patients who complain about jaw muscle tension. But sometimes just going into your body and escaping your head a little bit identifies some of these tensions and where they might be coming from. And just being able to go beyond being stressed and say that you feel tense about something or in a specific place can sometimes help identify a little bit more of what's going on. Oftentimes we have a boss who's putting pressure on us, so there's a big deadline or we're trying to get ready for an exam or a certification and we're feeling pressure. This is a really great way to go beyond stressed and I love one of the things about this is that oftentimes it comes with an expiration date. You know when it's going to go away. One of the words that Karen and I have been playing with as we've been working with these buzzwords and testing them in our own experience is anticipating. We find that it's really easy to take our emotions and just blame them on this crisis disruption of our routine and just say, oh, I'm stressed because of what's going on with the pandemic. When in fact, many times that we've identified that we're anticipating something, whether it's a simple phone call or something that we just want to get done, oftentimes a self-imposed sort of pressure. But anticipating has become a really helpful word for us in terms of managing our emotions and our responses. This third word that we chose, good, on the surface is a very positive word, but it is used so frequently as an automatic subconscious react 
uh, answer to the question of how are you. And I definitely know that when I was working in practice, I, my patients would come in, I would say, how are you? They would say, good. They'd say, how are you? And I would reply, good. Um, without really even giving any thought to the word, I just wanted to project a positive image. But imagine if you could use a, a word further on from good to explain actually why this was a positive thing. Maybe your day started really well, everybody got out the door on time, um, the sun was shining and you were actually feeling happy. Um, the second word here, energized, I love this word because it just projects this onto the other person that you're talking to. I'm feeling energized. It's just been a fantastic day. Really great. Um, the third word here is calm. And I think if somebody used this in response to one of my questions of how are you doing, I would actually be really intrigued to know why are they feeling so calm and how could I like learn from them to be more calm. So I think using a word further on than the initial buzzword just gives people a chance to think a little bit more and maybe even promote some conversation from that. I think using creative words is a great way to promote a conversation. And I think sometimes by using a word that almost transmits a little bit more energy or emotion can also give a lot of hope to people. And sometimes, especially now, I think there's a lot of people who are seeking a bit of hope and this is a really great tool that we can use for passing that on. Now we would like to take just a few minutes right here on this webinar for you to engage in a bit of an activity to identify your emotions more specifically. I'm going to ask you to take just a minute or two right here and just sit quietly and comfortably and explore what it is you are feeling right now. Chances are, it was a pretty common buzzword that came to mind. Now take that and really try to label it more specifically. Go beyond the buzzword and see if you can find a more descriptive word. Move on a little further and take notice of what physical sensations you are experiencing as you explore your emotions. More correctly identifying your emotions and sitting with them briefly often diminishes their intensity. Hopefully you experienced a little bit of that shift as we did this activity. A recent study looked at 230 teens and measured their ability to label their emotions specifically or vaguely, vaguely being such terms as good or bad. A study at the University of Rochester published in the journal Emotion found that the teens who were able to describe their emotions using precise language were less likely to develop increased depressive symptoms than those who used the vague terms. This is just an amazing scientific study that shows the example of labeling your emotions specifically, and it's so important in today's trend of teen depression. I think it's a really powerful demonstration of how labeling our emotions specifically is actually changing our brain chemistry. Identifying and experiencing an emotion allows us to accept how we are feeling and to thoughtfully respond or act. I completely agree with that, Julie, because right now I've found that it's hard to process how you're feeling about all the things that are going on in my mind. 
But having had this opportunity, like we've been playing with, to sit down and really be with my feelings just for a few minutes, it's given me a lot of needed clarity over what it is that's specifically bothering me. And interestingly, it probably isn't the virus majority of the time. It's related to something else and that's made it much easier to move on and actually face what's going on in a much more simple way. When I sat down and worked out what I was feeling, you'll remember that I used the buzzword bored. I knew there was something more behind this, so I questioned myself on what I really meant. I came to the conclusion that I had a sense of loss surrounding what I used to be and who I was now, and it made me feel a little bit empty really. I used to be somebody who was highly regarded for being good at orthodontics, and I really enjoyed getting to transform my patients lives by creating smiles for them. I loved that I was able to make a difference. That stood in stark contrast with the new me, who was quickly establishing herself as the go-to expert on doing laundry and having dinner ready on the table every evening. I took my passion for helping people through transformations and applied it to my desire to become a coach. I've combined my first-hand experience of being a practicing dental professional so that I can now give back and create transformations for dentists, physicians and healthcare professionals, people just like you and me. Let's transition and talk about how we can respect these experiences of other people, those people who are around us right now, and those on our dental teams. You may have heard of the term of holding space for someone. Essentially, this is about respecting or honouring another person's experience and allowing themselves to fully express or experience their own thoughts and emotions. It's also really important that we need to give space and respect to ourselves as well. There are a few key coaching concepts uh, that can help you do this to hold space and to show respect. And we just point to point out, because as dentists we're into the details, <laughs> that we have not figured out how to overcome the fact that when we move our PowerPoint slides into Adobe, it changes all the numbers to one. So just think of all of our four points as being all equally one. important. <laughs> Our first takeaway is being present. This is so important. It's both listening and observing. It's the verbal and the nonverbal. We think we're really good at this as dental professionals, but oftentimes we're not. Being present is specifically not racing to problem solve. We kind of think of ourselves as chief problem solvers but this is not what it takes to being present. It is fully releasing the unrelated thoughts and your own personal agenda. It is staying present even when your hygienist is staring at you from the hallway as you speak with your patient. It is viewing the individual as a whole person in their full and unique experience. It is going on beyond what is being said. In fact, a really great way to measure how well you are being present is if you are noticing what is not being said. A recent example of this was a longtime patient of mine who came into the office complaining of tooth sensitivity. She's almost always perfectly dentally healthy, and this day she couldn't seem to pinpoint the location of her tooth sensitivity at all. Something just didn't seem right to me. So before I even put on any gloves, I pushed back my stool and I invited her to share with me how her days were going. Turns out she had been seeing multiple physicians and specialists for a whole set of annoying symptoms and she didn't yet have a diagnosis. I let my schedule get behind and allowed her to share. After about 15 minutes or so, 
She seemed to feel much better, and she expressed to me how thankful she was to me because she hadn't fully or wholly felt like she was heard by any other doctor. She admitted that she knew that I couldn't solve her problem, and that it was likely the sensitivity that was coming and going was from her worry. What she really needed wasn't some desensitizing varnish, but for someone to acknowledge that what she was feeling was real. When you are present with someone, you will often physically feel a sense of calm and neutrality. All the while, you are remaining connected to this person that you are speaking with. When I let go of my agenda for the patient, I stopped trying to solve her sensitivity, and I allowed myself to be compassionate, yet neutral. Her need was met just by my being present with her. What strikes me from that story is how your willingness to be able to run late just to say this lady actually needs something more at the moment than varnish on her teeth was such a valuable gift to that patient in that use of the time. So I think that's a really beautiful example of that. It can be hard okay. sometimes. Our second point is about reflecting. It's reflecting what you have heard from a person back to them. And it will enable you to share your observations with them about what they've said. And yet at the same time, they can get to see something from a different perspective. They will feel that you have really listened and understood what they've said when you reflect information back to them. You might say, from what you've said, it sounds like you really value getting to travel. It's also important to notice their nonverbal communication clues too, as Judy said. What are they doing with their body? Are they stressed, excited, or nervous? And don't be shy at reflecting back those physical manifestations that you see in the conversation. Say something like, I'm observing you're feeling really tense when whilst we're talking about this topic. Did you notice that you were wringing your hands whilst you were talking? And even them seeing you do that same motion back to them is another way of reflecting and saying, I heard you, I understand. And it gives them time to think, gosh, I really maybe did feel like this instead of it just being them not thinking about it in much depth. We're so often such poor observers of ourselves and hearing ourselves or seeing our manifest mannerisms reflected back to ourselves really often uncovers some of our own blind spots and I think this is a really important tool as we try to understand each other as generations where the differences can be bigger and the blind spots can be bigger. Our third coaching takeaway is the value of silence. This is one of my favorites. As an introvert I love silence. I can spend days in silence. I can drive for hours in silence. But I struggle with this one a bit more in the professional world. My brain goes so fast that I'm on to the next thought so quickly that I oftentimes tell people in conversation that I'm an interrupter because I have to get it out before I'm on to my next thought. However, there is real value in the pause. It allows you and whomever is sharing with you to contemplate their words, and it will often lead to a much deeper thought process or a resource or an idea. Just as we honor heroes with a period of silence, a small silence is a really powerful way of not acknowledging and honoring an individual. I think this one really takes a little bit of practice um, and something I like to do myself if I'm in a conversation that I'm finding really exciting and somebody has paused, is to count to my head to five, count to five in my head, just so I know that I've given that person either the opportunity if they want to continue talking, or we can both just take in what's been said before jumping in there, but definitely practice on this one will help. Our fourth point is that of being curious. 
during conversations, be really inquisitive about the other person and ask questions from a place where you really genuinely want to know more about what they're saying. Yes or no questions won't really get you very much information at all and it doesn't allow for very much creative thinking to happen. A really valuable phrase is, tell me more about that. It invites the person who's responding to think more deeply about what they're saying, as well as giving themselves the opportunity to think about their own ideas more fully. I really love this prompt when I'm speaking with my clients. It's like winding up a little toy and setting them off and so much valuable thought and conversation can come from just that one prompt of asking somebody to go a bit deeper and tell you something extra that they haven't already thought about. If you can remember anything from today, being curious will always make any situation or interaction better. Curiosity is a true key both in successful coaching and in successful multi-generational relationships. A little while ago, I wrote an article about generations and mentoring and curiosity. In part of my research, I read the book, Wisdom at Work. One of my favorite quotes from the book goes as follows. While creativity and innovation get the headlines, curiosity is the elixir that gives them stamina. Crisis will breed innovation, and it's going to be pretty exciting to see what comes of that. But curiosity will ultimately be what makes us stronger together. To summarize, viewing each individual as a whole person with their full web of experiences and remaining deeply curious about that person or the people on our teams or in our families, these are the most powerful techniques that we have in bridging sensitivities between generations, family members, team members, and our community at large. As we conclude, we are currently living in this time of social distancing, but I wanna circle us back to a different thought, and that is the importance of human touch. Technology is bringing us together in new and very different important ways right now, but I think the most valuable tool that we have both in dentistry and in coaching is the incredible human hand and its power to connect to repair and to heal. The world will never quite be the same again. It will likely take many people quite a while to become comfortable with a handshake, a hand on the shoulder, or even a real hug. Maybe even some of our traditions will change. But I hope that through all of this, we will not forget how powerful the human physical connection can be. Since I moved across the Atlantic to be here in America, I have really learned the importance and also significance of human touch in my relationships with others. I FaceTime my parents every single day and without the virtual connection, I can pretty much guarantee that our relocation here wouldn't have been as successful as it has been. But I really miss being able to physically touch them. When I get to return home to England once a year, the thing that I anticipate with so much excitement is being able to touch my family and friends. My little niece is three years old and when I get to tell her that I'm going to be able to come to her house, I'm going to be able to pick her up, I'm going to be able to hug her and carry her around, it's just such an exciting feeling. And as I talk to you about it now, I can even feel it here in my chest that that is just so exciting to be able to do it. And it really is just the best. Let's face it, virtual hugs are just not the same. We just wanna say a really big thank you again to Carrie Free for inviting us to share with you today. And we hope that you will find one or two of these coaching techniques helpful as we navigate these changing times together.
Wow. Thank you, Julie and Karen both. Uh, that was amazing. Of course, you know, coaching is near and dear to me. But uh, I took, you know, a whole page full of notes, uh, and that was really, really well done. So I just want to commend you both on that. Thank you. Thank you for oh, leading hey. the way. I tell you, just uh, looking at your presentation, I have to, Karen, I have to say that I really uh, can relate to your experience of feeling lost and bored and grieving. Um, I retired from clinical practice last June and took three months off to play, which I had planned on doing. I hadn't really planned on retiring from clinical practice. And when I was supposed to go back to work in October, Turns out the person I hired as a replacement for me really was a replacement for me. And so I really wasn't needed at the practice. And, you know, I've had over 40 years of practice, and I knew I was going to retire at some point. But had really, I guess I'd been in denial is probably the best way to describe it. Um, and so I took the opportunity to go ahead and retire. And I, I was hit with all of these mixed emotions that I really had not prepared myself for, I was really blindsided by. And I was really in kind of a dark space for a couple of months, and it took me a while to kind of get my head around it. Um, because, And I think mostly because I was surprised by it because I really did not anticipate that. And so uh, that's something that I can really identify, that whole grieving process, because I didn't expect that. And again, I've got so many other professional things that I do and that I'm still doing, and so it's not like I'm retired, but I've just not, I'm no longer working clinically, let's put it that way. But I still went through this grieving process because I think so much of my own identity, I thought of myself always first and foremost as being a dentist and helping people. And to kind of not have that or to let go of that, it was a really uh, surprising, unanticipated experience the best way I could describe it. But the grieving part caught me by surprise, yeah, I mean, and, that, and that was the hardest Yeah, I think it's the thing that you don't realize, sorry, you don't realize how much a part of your life it is, and then what significance that plays to you until it's gone. Yeah, I think, I think to a degree we all identify yeah, ourselves based on how we spend most of our time, right? And, you know, whether mm -hmm. you see yourself as a you know, a wife or a husband or, you know, a father. I mean, we have all those roles that we play, you know, in our lives and in our relationships. But then, you know, we have our professional role as well or our career. And that, you know, we spend so many of our waking moments doing that that at some point it kind of becomes our identity. And it, and, it, and it's too bad that that happens as I sit and think about it here. But but I know that for me, it just caught me completely off guard, and I, and I grieved it for a while. And that process is really important to go through. I mean, I think any change in our life, it is important to allow ourselves a bit of that that processing time, and, and that was part of why we wanted to speak to that today, is just allowing, giving yourself the permission to grieve a change. It doesn't mean that what you're transitioning to in isn't good. It usually is, but there's still sometimes that grief process of the, of the change. Yeah, I would I'll have jump to say, in. Julia, oh. I'll go ahead, Kendall. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, I was just going to jump in and say thank you so much to all three of you. Um, I think this is just such an important message, and I know it speaks to our listeners in different ways, just depending on where everyone is at in their own career, their own journey, and in their own life. Um, and we do have, um, I think, a few questions that I would love to throw out to you guys, and we can continue the dialogue. Um, the first question that I wanted to ask, and maybe uh, Dr. Kellogg, if you don't mind jumping on this one first, and then we can get everybody else's input. Um, how, what are your recommendations for how we can stay connected and support teams right now um, as they might be, be feeling disconnected to their job or to their, you know, their boss or um, their, their leaders? That's a great question, and I think 
each individual and each practice is dealing with that in their own way. Um, I'll give just a brief example of what I'm doing in my practice is um, due to a lot of the wellness coaching and things that we do, um, I'm very close with my hygiene team and there's six hygienists that I work with. And so right when this started, when we were all laid off of work, essentially, um, we started up a Tuesday morning, one hour that we have virtual coffee together. And it gives us a brief time to share how we're feeling, what are we worried about, how much are we enjoying our free time, some of these things, as well as we've turned it into a way to really stay passionate and connected with what we really um, feel so so um, strongly and, and burdened for to take care and care of our patients. And so we're also using that hour to do um, some learning things in a more casual sort of way in a small group um, setting and just just taking on some topics that sometimes we just don't have time to do in our in our busy weeks. And so we've really grown to to really look forward to that time together. Yes, and a follow-up question. Did your team, how, was there an adjustment period getting used to the technology with your team? I know that a lot of teams um, probably now are, are working okay together virtually, um, but initially kind of had, you know, there was some struggle getting everyone to work online and and also becoming comfortable with the virtual connection versus, you know, the physical, like, real-life connection that we're used to having. Did you guys experience that struggle? Um, yeah, I would say to a certain extent. I reached out um, to my hygienist, and I'm very uh, used to working on Zoom. We use this a lot in the coaching world and, and some of our um, – meeting planning of doing virtual things and so I was used to that and so I had to have some text messages going back and coaching a few of them of getting the 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 right app downloaded on their phone and and working with it um, and I would say maybe the first week it was the first week we were off of work and almost I think they were treating it like a vacation and so it's like oh brother we have to meet with Dr. Julie you know but then I think they really realized how fun it was to see each other's faces because it really is a huge adjustment to not seeing each other every day like we're used to. And and now, like I said, they're really looking forward to that one hour a week that we really do get to see each other's faces as if we were together in the office, the closest thing we can simulate right now. Um, so we did have a little adjustment in the first couple of weeks, but um, as all of us are, we, we're adapting and transitioning. Yeah. Yeah, phone calls are just not quite the same. Once you do team phone calls and then you start implementing video, it does, it helps a lot. It's not the same, of course, it's not a replacement, but it does help so much. Um, Dr. Uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, one of my hygienists, I said one of my hygienists lives out in the country quite a ways out and this last week she was sitting outside while she was on Zoom and the birds were so loud that we all just kind of sat there and silence, just meditating and listening to her birds. It was quite a healing moment together, actually. And, you and you know, it becomes more personal for everyone on the team, too. You get to see their house, their living space. You get to see their kids coming in and out. I know as we've been setting up um, this conference, we've got to meet uh, Dr. Tyndall's husband, and we've got to meet her dog today. Um, so all of that is yeah. just, <laughs> it's very fun. It creates a, a much more personal connection. Um, Dr. Tindall, uh, I wanted to... I just, sorry, Kendall. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, in, in terms of the like virtual connection that people are learning to establish, it's interesting when we've been talking about generations, of looking at younger people and how they, they are so used to virtual connections. I mean, my girls, face, they've been at school with their friends all day, they come home and they still FaceTime the people they've been with all day. Mm -hmm. But now that they are learning that the virtual connection isn't enough, and they are getting to a point where they so desperately want to see their friends again. Um, one of my daughters yesterday said, I just want to hug my friends. I just, I just want to do it. And I'm like, so somebody who's really used to that technology now realizes that it isn't a substitute for the real thing. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. um, another oh. question, uh, Dr. Tyndall, that I think I'll throw to you. What do you think is the dentist's role in managing and helping our patients manage their emotions? So especially when we're talking about um, like dental anxiety. Oh, I think for me, 
I was always the person in my practice where I worked that if there was a nervous patient or an anxious patient, they would always say, give them to Karen. <laughs> and I think it was because, like Julie, when she was talking about being present with her patient, and that's what she needed that extra time, that was something that I was prepared to give my patients and I was prepared to give them the extra time that they needed. And it's having the empathy with them that I can that you completely understand what they're going through and recognize it as a genuine emotion that these people are having and not belittling it in any way, which sometimes is very easy to do when it's something, say for example, this patient was coming in to have a filling done or a restoration. Dentists do this multiple times a day and it's not a big deal to the dentist, but it's a really big deal to that patient. And I think having that acknowledgement that the patient sees that you understand what they're talking about, um, I think goes a huge way to helping that patient. What do you think, Julie? Yeah, I agree. And I think that using these techniques that we've talked about today to help your patient be able to label their emotions, what they're feeling physically or mentally, emotionally, um, can be really reassuring process for the patient, as well as giving you some really helpful information about what you can change in your treatment. Oftentimes, it's just something really small by simply identifying what it is that makes them uncomfortable about being there at that appointment and just using those techniques to help walk that patient through identifying those emotions and those feelings um, can really, really kind of bring everybody in that operatory together as a team towards making it a better experience. Mm. Um, the last question that I'll throw out to all of you, um, what would you recommend right now to hold space for patients? Um, we have listeners who are wanting to be present, um, but maybe not really sure how to reach out or what to say and how to find the right balance of staying connected but not maybe reaching out too much. It, it's an interesting question, especially in this time where we're not interacting with our patients. Um, I know one of my personal projects is just trying to reach out um, via a phone call to some of my patients who I know are probably more isolated due to their higher age um, and not having a lot of family around. And it's just um, basically picking up the phone call and just inquiring about them and literally just giving them the opportunity to share. Um, shutting up. <laughs> Calling and shutting up basically is what it, what it comes down to. Um, but in our practices, I think it's, I think the biggest challenge for me and what I challenge myself to do um, is really identify when it is that moment that that patient is looking for somebody to just simply solve their problem. Because some patients, that's all they're looking for. They just want you to say, tooth A needs this treatment and here's your options, A, B, C, you know, whatever. Um, and then other patients need a lot more. And it's really knowing um, when to put on that hat of being the dentist problem solver or treat you know, or delivering the treatment versus being, okay, I'm going to be the coach and I'm simply just going to be present with this patient and just be there in their experience. And I think I would add to that almost when you're holding space with this person and showing them that you're really listening is don't be shy like to, to almost say something that is recognizing what they're physically showing or they're emotionally feeling. Because some people think, oh gosh, if I don't want to dive into that bucket of emotions and what am I going to unleash? But almost ask the question that gives the patient permission to say, yeah, I really am feeling like this or I've, I've had a really bad morning and this is why I'm being this way. Some patients won't take it and that's fine and you have to let them just get you know keep going on with their appointment the way they want to do it they might not want to share but then maybe those people that are just waiting for the opportunity and by you asking that right question that just unlocks that door for them that they can say yeah I'm going to tell the dentist today about what I'm feeling so I would say don't be shy to ask the question about how they're actually feeling 
Yeah, that's important, and to meet the patient where they're at, because you're right, every patient is coming into that appointment. I know that as a patient, every patient is coming into the appointment um, feeling a different way and needing something different from their providers, so that's, that's huge. Um, Dr. Cooch, did you have any comments that you would like? Oh, sorry, Dr. Kellogg. Oh, I said, I think that um, Kim has the classic story about this. <laughs> and, and oh, yeah, yeah, you know, it's just, I think, you know, the whole concept of just being present uh, for the patient and listening um, and, and really being there. I mean, so often, um, we, you know, we're not listened to, we're not heard, right? And we're not, we get so focused on our routine and our schedule and, you know, we're doing this and we're doing that treatment that a lot of times we forget that there's a person attached to those teeth and they're, and where they're coming from that day. Um, I just look back, um, my, my coaching experiences, uh, when I first got interested in coaching probably 15 years ago with Barosha, which by the way is, she is just an amazing individual, and I've learned so much from her. And going through that coaching program was life-changing for me. But um, I really was interested in, you know, trying to be more effective at treating dental caries about 20 years ago. And when I really came to understand that it was a disease and that I needed to look at the risk factors that were causing the disease rather than just treating the, you know, the signs of the disease, the cavities, um, some of those require behavioral changes in the patient. And so I was totally lost because, you know, in dentistry, we're taught how to drill and fill, and we're really good at that, and we get better at it the longer we do it, and we get focused on that. And um, so I, I was just totally, totally lost when it came to, well, I don't know how to sit down with somebody and coach them through making behavioral lifestyle change, dietary changes, whatever it is. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to go learn how to, to coach. I'm going to go through this communication program. And I'm going to, so I went through this at the time. It was called wellness coaching. And so I went through this wellness coaching with Ferocia. And I, and I have to laugh now because I had a very, very small, specific need. I needed, and I, and I was very clear with Ferocia that I needed just to know how to coach a patient who had dental caries to become, you know, make behavioral changes so they could become healthy. And she absolutely assured me that I would get that from her program. And so I went through the whole program with her. And, you know, by 9 o'clock, the first break that first morning, I realized, wow, this isn't just like my dental caries patients. This is like for, God, this is for all my patients. And by the second break in the morning, I was at, wow, this is, uh, this is not just, you know, for them. This is for me, too, and, like, my family. And then by noon, I was like, wow, this is a really important life skill. And, uh, and, I, and I came away from that with such a greater appreciation for how to communicate with patients and listen to them and reflect and, and help them understand what they were, identified their emotions. And that's such an important skill to be able to have. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, I never forget the one of the um, one of the questions you know we were taught was, you know, if you can get somebody to really attach, you know, understand. We don't make change based on on what we think. We make change based on how we feel. So if you could get a person to identify how this has affected them, how they feel about it, and I'll never forget, I, I my one of the first patients I asked that question to was a you know, a 50-year-old professor who had severe dental caries, and it was disfiguring. And so I asked him, so tell me how this has affected your life. And he immediately broke down and started crying, you know. And so I'm a guy, right? Guys don't deal in emotions to begin with, right? And so I'm sitting there thinking, my, my inside voice is going, I am never going to ask that question ever again, right? I'm like, scratch this one. Off of the list of questions to choose today, eliminate that one. And it's interesting because um, I, I went from that point over a period of time to understanding that dental caries 
carries a tremendous amount of emotional baggage and shame and guilt and pain that I had no appreciation of. I've been treating it for 30 years at that point in time, and I didn't understand how traumatic having teeth that look like that was emotionally for somebody. And I mean, I think we all think it is a little bit, but I really didn't appreciate the depth of, of the baggage that comes with it. And and I really got to a point in time now where I'm comfortable. In fact, there's a box of Kleenex on my consult table. So as I'm sitting there alongside you, and we're looking at pictures of your teeth, and we're talking about you know the things that we've identified, our findings, um, they can get emotional and they can cry. And I, and I can put a hand on the, the human touch is so important. And it's such an important part of healing. Yeah, I can put just a hand on their shoulder to just reassure them, you know, it's okay. And it's going to be okay. And I'm here, you know. So that was really, I think, a life-changing experience in that whole coaching realm for me to learn how to be really present for somebody. But also, at the same point in time, to be their advocate and help them understand where they're at and how they can get to some place that they desire to go to. So uh, for me, that's kind of my classic story, Julie. But literally, I was sitting there that day thinking, like, I am never asking that question ever again, right? And, and, and it's funny, you know, I've made a lot of progress as a coach. I'll say that. <laughs> Lesson learned, it takes time. So if it doesn't go perfectly the first time that you try it, don't give up. I try again because it'll get better. Um, well, again, thank you so much, Dr. Tyndall, Dr. Kellogg, Dr. Cooch. Um, this is just really, really good information to share with everyone, and we're so lucky to have you a part of our team and to be part of this Connect conference. Um, before we conclude, a few items to mention. So after listening to this, if you have questions or would like to learn more, please don't hesitate to reach out to either speaker at their contact info listed on the screen so you can see it there. Um, we truly believe sharing is caring, so you are welcome to share this link with any of your friends, family, colleagues. I think this is one of those topics that, as Dr. Cooch said, it transcends just dentistry, so please share it with your family. Um, last but not least, thank you to our listeners. Um, you're the reason that we are able to do these sessions, and we appreciate every bit of your support. So thank you, thank you. Um, I'll leave it to you three. Do you guys have any other last-minute thoughts before we conclude? I just want to really thank Julie and Karen. I know you guys put a lot of work in this presentation, and you cannot teach whole person coaching in 45 minutes or an hour, but you guys did a, a very incredible job uh, giving a real basic understanding and some takeaway tools that people can start to use so I, I know you put a lot of time in, and I just want to, you did an awesome job. You guys are rock stars, and I just want to thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Just, so everybody, be safe. Just be, it takes practice. Bye-bye. <laughs>